In Unit 2, we will examine developments in realism. In the previous unit, we noted the realistic impulses in American literature at the end of the 19th century. We see the depiction of ordinary people in ordinary circumstances, use of ordinary speech and dialogue, settings that are realistic and based on actual places, and an interest in contemporary life. We also paid attention to aspects in these works that aren't so realistic those narrative details and techniques that are obviously invented. For example, the coincidence that we see in plots, romantic speech or descriptions, and the use of allegory and symbolism. So Sylvia in A White Heron, for example, isn't just a girl experiencing New England wilderness. She represents nature or wilderness herself. And the hunter isn't just an outsider to this region. He represents the threat of society to the wilderness. Two of the stories that we are reading for Unit 2 take up William Dean Howell's moral imperative to create realistic fiction that calls attention to social problems while addressing the problems of realistic representation. In particular, Charles Chestnut's A Wife of His Youth and Soy Sin Farr's Mrs. Spring Fragrance both call attention to issues related to race. Chestnut's story, The Wife of His Youth, on the surface, comes off as a type of O. Henry story, one that provides an interesting and surprising twist at the end. Chestnut has been described as a local colorist, working in a mode pioneered by white authors such as Joel, Handler Chair, Joel Chandler Harris, whose Uncle Ramus stories fe featuring romanticized versions of plantation life were highly popular. But the wife of his youth resists romanticized images of plantation life by highlighting one of the negative outcomes of slavery. And that outcome is the separation of loved ones, the lasting, the lasting disruption of family life in African American communities. Writings by African Americans in the postbellum period often feature family members searching for and finding one another. In addition, underlying the wife of his youth are questions about the depiction of black American life. In which direction does reality lie? Is it toward the South and rural plantation, or toward northern cities where many blacks fled after and during the Civil War? Let's use the idea of W.E.B. Du Bois's conception of double consciousness to look at Chestnut's story. One result of doing this, we see that black life and culture can easily become shaped by mainstream American culture that privileges light skin over dark. We see this from the very first paragraph in Chestnut's description of the Blue Vein Society. And this description is on the first page of the story, which is um, 706 in our anthology. The Blue Vein's purpose was to establish and maintain correct social standards among a people whose social condition presented an almost unlimited room for improvement. By accident, combined perhaps with some natural affinity, the society consisted of individuals who were, generally speaking, more white than black. Some envious outsider made the suggestion that no one was eligible for membership who was not white enough to show blue veins. Although the group declares it considers character and culture rather than color, even their names suggest a preference for those with lighter skin tones, they also prefer those who were not born in slavery as if these were characteristics that anyone has any choice about. This is an, an exclusive, not inclusive group. Outsiders criticize the blue veins, but once on the inside, they no longer do so. Mr. Ryder, who is described as one of the most conservative in this group, believes at his core that he has left his old life and his old self behind in the South and achieved full amalgamation into sophisticated urban Northern life. He belongs to a higher economic status. He has a good, meaning a white collar job, and is no longer a common laborer. He has a nice house and a respect, on a respectable street. An important sign of his advancement is his love of poetry. Unfortunately, his rise in social station has been accompanied by class bias and internalized racism or bias based on color. And this is a term that Chestnut would have used. Writer is an individual living on the color line. We see this bias when he says, and this is a quotation you can find on page 708, I have no race prejudice. 
I'm going to stop here for a minute and point out that whenever someone begins a sentence like this, most likely they're going to end it by saying something that demonstrates race prejudice. I have no race prejudice, but we people of mixed blood are ground between the upper and nether millstone. Our fate lies between absorption by the white race and extinction in the black. In this passage, writer exhibits either or thinking. In other words, he believes that an individual can be either white or black, but not both, even though the existence of mixed race people suggests that you can be both. There's also the hint of the melting pot ideal, with blacks being absorbed into white society. Of course, mainstream society would be working hard against this by, for example, enforcing the one drop rule and laws against miscegenation, which, by the way, were on the books in southern states until 19, the 1960s. Ryder also expresses a belief in racial hierarchy a so-called white identity that for him and the blue veins is a forward step. Black identity is a step backwards. Hmm, that sounds like race, race prejudice to me. This is one of the problems identified by the story, racism and a lack of awareness of it. Just as Ryder is musing on these ideas, Liza enters the story. This is an interesting moment in many ways. He has just been practicing a poem by Tennyson that privileges and extols the superiority of fair skin or paleness. Writer can't read these lines in honor of Mrs. Dixon, the woman he loves, whose skin isn't pale, but he reads the rest of the poem. Liza stands in contrast to the pale beauty described in Tennyson's poem. She is described, and you can find this description on the bottom of page 709, a little woman not five feet tall and proportioned to her height. She wore a blue calico gown of ancient cut, a little red shawl fastened around her shoulders with an old-fashioned brass brooch, and a large bonnet profusely ornamented with faded red and yellow artificial flowers. And she was very black, so black that her toothless gums revealed when she opened her mouth to speak were not red, but blue. She looked like a bit of the old plantation life, summoned up from the past by the wave of a magician's wand. Liza is the wife of his youth, whom he lost touch with after having run away for fear that he would be sold despite being freeborn. She represents the past, and this is a history that includes slavery. She also believes in what Chestnut calls conjure or hoodoo, a set of folk beliefs combining elements of Caribbean and West African healing and spiritual practices. In short, she stands for all those elements that Ryder would like to shed from his identity. In the end, Ryder acknowledges her. Invoking another Tennyson poem, he accepts the dictum, to thine own self be true. Here, double consciousness leads to something positive and not to low self-esteem or internalized racism. Being aware of the demands of mainstream culture and black culture and history leads him to a better version of himself. Writer develops an awareness of prejudice and a desire to overcome it, but this isn't going away and it's not going to be easy. We are left not knowing what will happen next after the last page of this narrative. We don't know if the social club is going to accept Liza and incorporate her in the social gatherings, nor do we know if Liza would even want that. Soyce and Farr's Mrs. Spring Fragrance also calls our attention to racism at the turn of the 20th century. Like Chestnut, Soyce and Farr is calling for social change and thus also heeding Howell's call in Aditha. But there are more decidedly unrealistic aspects in this story, which I'm featuring in a section called Realism. For example, the story setting. The spring fragrances live in an integrated Seattle neighborhood, which doesn't in fact mirror the experiences of the majority of immigrants from China who lived in crowded ethnic enclaves that would later become the West Coast, West Coast Chinatowns that we know today. In addition is the characterization of Mrs. Spring Fragrance herself. When Mrs. Spring Fragrance first arrived in Seattle, Soisen Farr writes, she was unacquainted with even one word of the American language. Five years later, her husband, speaking of her, said, there are no more American words for her learning. And everyone who knew Mrs. Spring Fragrance agreed with Mr. Spring Fragrance. And 
Her linguistic acumen is nothing short of remarkable. She is not your typical turn of the century immigrant. She also speaks in a manner that does not accurately reflect the speech of non-native English speakers whose first language is Chinese. Soi Sin Far also sprinkles exotic and sensational images throughout the story. Americans were fascinated and scandalized at this time by arranged marriages, for example. And in this way, Soi Sin Far, Soi Sin Far provides us exotic images of Chinese culture that American audiences craved just like Mr. Spring Fragrance's next door neighbor who wants what he says are sensationalized images of Chinese gangs and Tong Wars. But even as Soi Sin Far supplied these images, she also undercuts them. For example, although Mr. and Mrs. Spring Fragrance's marriage was arranged, we are told they fell in love with each other before they married. So this is both an arranged and a romantic marriage based on individual choice, a type of fusion, if you will, between Western and Eastern cultural practices. In addition, Jade is clearly not subservient to her husband, despite her self-description of herself as, quote, an ever-loving and obedient woman, which is how she signs her letters to her husband. In fact, all through the story, Jade is in control of the situation, and she even manipulates her husband a little bit. Notice that her husband is also known by her name. He is Mrs. Mr. Spring Fragrance. But there is tension in the story. Jade is supposed to be obedient, and Mr. Spring Fragrance feels the need to protect the image of being dominant and in control. When his wife asks to stay away for a little longer, he pretends that this is his desire, what he wants. He tells his cousin, I have changed my mind about her staying longer. I am bidding her remain a week longer as I wish to give a smoking party during her absence. Of course, he doesn't realize that his wife has been playing matchmaker to two couples and undermining the traditional wishes of their parents. In this way, the story models a negotiation of Chi Chinese customs represented by arranged marriages with American ones represented by marrying for love. She honors both in her solution of getting the teacher's son to fall in love with another woman so that Laura can marry the man she loves. This motif, arranged marriage versus marrying for love, is a common feature in immigrant American literature of this time. It dramatizes the clash of cultures. For female immigrant writers, the choice between cultures is often featured as a choice between lovers. One represents the old world, one represents the new. This story calls attention also to the inequities experienced by immigrants from China. It isn't all about romance. In a letter, so in a letter Mrs. Spring Fragrant writes to her husband, she provides a description of a lecture she attends on the subject of America, the protector of China. She writes, it was most exhilarating, and the effect of so much expression of benevolence leads me to beg of you to forget to remember that the barber charges you one dollar for a shave while he humbly submits to the American man a bell of 15 cents. And murmur no more because your honored elder brother on a visit to this country is detained under the roof tree of this great government instead of under your own humble roof. Console him with the reflection that he is protected under the sign of the eagle, the emblem of liberty. What is the loss of 1,000 years or 10,000 times $10 compared with the happiness of knowing oneself so securely, securely sheltered? Of course, this letter is laced with irony, if not on Jade's part, then on Swiss and Farr's. And it also provides a criticism of unfair pricing and taxes Levied on, immigrate, uh, uh, levied on immigrants from China and immigration laws, especially the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, a law that wasn't repealed until 1943. Irony also is in play in the multiple descriptions of Tennyson as an American poet. Eaton, born in England, was well aware that Tennyson was British. She seems to suggest an inability to tell all whites apart, mirroring Anglo-Americans' ignorance of the many ethnicities included under the category Asian. 
By calling attention to racial bias, Jade convinces her husband to acknowledge gender inequities, which have limited Laura to an arranged marriage to a man she doesn't love. In the end, two couples marry for love, and Jade is reconciled to her husband, who has bristled at signs of her independence. The story also encourages us to consider the choices Soisenfar has to make as an artist in terms of her employment of realism. And this is the last point I want to make. As the head notes tells us, Soisenfar, whose real name was Edith Maud Eaton, was born to a Chinese mother and a British father. She started out as a journalist and published newspaper articles about the Chinese immigrant community in Montreal. She never made a living as a writer, though she wrote and published a lot, and always had to supplement her writing income with secretarial work. She also worked as a stenographer and sold newspaper subscriptions. But she was able to place her fiction more easily after she adopted the Chinese name Soisenfar. As a writer, she was faced with contrasting impulses. On the one hand, she wanted to produce works that reflected a unique perspective and life experiences, what it really is like to be a person of color. On the other hand, she wanted to produce goods that were marketable and acceptable to a wide audience. This, of course, may be the dilemma of our, all artists. Add to that race, and in Eaton's case, class, and we have a larger understanding of the difficult pressures experienced by writers of color like Soisen Farr and Charles Chestnut. If they create the best expression of their experiences, they won't be successful and sell their works. But if they create what audiences want, sensationalized, stereotypical, unrealistic portrayals, they, fall, they fail to express themselves and reject their own experience. Eaton as Soisenfar is negotiating this reality in Mrs. Spring Fragrance. Audiences wanted flowery speech, arranged marriages, patriarchal Chinese husbands, and obedient wives. We get all that. But at the same time, she undermines it all. And this, too, is part of the realist impulse. By undermining the illusion, Soisenfar is being realistic. We may not be seeing reality, objective reality that is, but we know that what we are seeing isn't real.